Good morning. Thank you for joining us this morning. Um, my name is Jonathan Regeer, and this is James Stuyve. Stuyve? Stevie. Stevie. Sorry. I can't believe it doesn't know my name. <laughs> we both work for Garmin. A little about the company. We were founded in 1989. Our revenues this year are targeting around $3 billion. Uh, we're on the on the scale of a Fortune 100 company, although because our official base is Switzerland, we don't uh, actually show up on the Fortune list. And we make GPS products. You may know us for the Nuvi, which is the car navigation product. However, our first product was actually in an airplane. Uh, we build really amazing glass cockpit systems for companies like Cessna, Beechcraft, and Lear. We're also huge in fitness. We make some really awesome watches. We do marine and outdoors as well. We also just released a product called Verb 360. Think something like a GoPro, except you've got two cameras and they're shooting a 360 degree field at all times. And uh, you can, if you load the uh, video footage on your phone and you start turning, the footage turns with you. So that's a pretty amazing product. Your move GoPro. A little history on our, uh, our cloud native journey. So we started, uh, our, our first introduction to Cloud Foundry was in December of 2013 at one of our company hackathons. We started deploying to Pivotal Web Services and had, had a great time there and learned a lot, knew we needed to, uh, we needed to move down this path. Uh, at that point, we didn't have any Cloud Foundry foundations. All of our deployments were manual. We were deploying about two times a month, emergency releases as necessary, but those were kind of, there, there was a big deal and nobody wanted to do them. So. We didn't do a lot of those. Our dev culture was uh, done meant, hey, I got something in the code review. And done to our customers, of course, was 60 days later by the time that, that software actually made, made it to production. All our production at that point was VMs, and our VMs were vastly over provisioned. We'll talk more about that a little bit later. So here's a little uh, overview of our journey. Uh, we've had uh, a couple of pivotal dojos. We've uh, made significant uh, time and money investments in automation. We've got production applications now running in Cloud Foundry. Uh, we're shooting for Cloud Native in everything we do. Later on, we'll talk a little bit about where we are now and Garmin Labs. So I'm gonna start with our uh, first Pivotal Dojo in February 2015. I call this Dojo Light. We, we saw Cloud Foundry and we knew we needed to have Cloud Foundry running locally and so, uh, we were gonna install it very quickly. Uh, thanks in large part to our Pivotal rep, he, he uh, rounded up a band of Pivotal gunslingers and brought them in to help us get that done. And the reason I call this Dojo Light is because we didn't really do a lot of the prep work that we needed to do. And the slide here with, ne uh, with Neo, I chose this picture because, yeah, we had a dojo, and, and if you think about it, Neo at this point in, in the movie, he goes, I know Kung Fu and then he proceeds to have his ass kicked. And that's really what happened to us. Uh, a lot of times doing software or, or, or doing the hardware we do, uh, building GPSs for aviation, building car GPSs, we're really good at building hardware. We build some really amazing stuff. Our autopilots are second to none, and uh, well, that's a whole other topic. Uh, so we have this thing called the Garmin way, which is basically, hey, th this is how we do things, and it's worked really well for us. Well, when you come to something like Cloud Foundry, where you have a team of 600 people building this amazing platform, it's a dumb idea not to listen to what they say. So take it, from, oops, sorry, take it from us. If they tell you this is a bad idea, you should install your platform this way, that's a great thing to listen to. Uh, so our first platform that, that we stood up, um, it was a success. It was certainly not production grade, and that is nothing on the platform that was on us on how we'd employed it. And uh, we learned it was a good time to, uh, to, to move ahead down the road from there. So then, for real, uh, we started a, a true dojo with all of the planning that comes with that process in May of 2016. It was an eight week process. The first four weeks we took and we built a production grade Cloud Foundry. That Cloud Foundry is still running today and it runs production applications. The next four weeks of the dojo, we brought four different teams in, and the goal was to take their applications and make them cloud native one week at a time and run production. Now that was a little bit uh, optimistic. 
We did take production, uh, app, production traffic on one of those applications, but the other ones uh, aren't quite, weren't quite ready. They are mostly running on production now, or running on Cloud Foundry in production now. But uh, again, that was one of those things where Pivotal said you should take a little bit longer uh, when you bring a product or bring a group in. And we were like, no, 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 we want to expose as many people as we can. So Garmin way again, our bad. So obviously, um Doing Cloud Foundry, you, you you must do automation from my perspective. Um, yes, it's my it's my uh, joy at Garmin to be kind of responsible from an IT perspective to get us into CI/CD and make sure we're doing automation as much as possible. So obviously, we want to automate all the things. Um, Jonathan started out in automation with uh, Jenkins jobs that were several Jenkins jobs linked together, which was extremely brittle, um, kind of hard to maintain. Uh, copy paste reuse it, it was kind of a pain so um, I said no don't do that um, it, it was great it was a good place to start but it wasn't a good place to stay and so I looked at concourse to be honest with you and at that time that was a while ago concourse has made leaps and bounds since then but uh, you needed to install it in Bosch back then and I did not have anybody who could do that for me they were all busy doing other things and so because of that we really went with Jenkins it had uh, developer developer uh, uh, familiarity, people were comfortable with it, and I can reuse existing infrastructure. So we went down the Jenkins pipeline path with uh, pipeline as code using Jenkins files. Um, I, I think that was probably the right approach for us at the time. I, I'm not saying that Jenkins is always going to be the be all end all, but what it did lead us to was what I would call the pipeline wild, wild west. Um, everybody was doing their pipeline their way and people were copying code there was uh, we weren't doing uh, dry at all there was no reuse at all and um, there was one project they had five separate Jenkins files that are essentially identical and then they needed to make a change well good luck because that's five different changes you're going to have to make and affect five different applications from a deployment perspective so um, we have instituted what I would call um, I'm gonna go, go ahead slide. go yeah. to the next slide um, what I would call pipelines that are opinionated and it's a shared library pipeline and I can get somebody up and running with that pipeline in maybe five minutes now. So they copy and paste a Jenkins file and make minor JSON config file change and they're deploying to Cloud Foundry in minutes. So that's, that's kind of a big win for us. Um, the developer doesn't have to know Jenkins, he doesn't have to really understand a lot about how to get his app deployed to Cloud Foundry, he just checks in code and it deploys. But one thing automation we've kind of failed at from my perspective is the feedback loop. Um, Garmin has historically had a QA department that did all of our QA testing for us and as a developer you threw it over the wall and hey test this for me. Um, that, that culture which is a change that we're working on making still exists and so the developers are not used to actually being responsible for their code all the way through to production. So we really, really need to implement automated acceptance testing. Um, it's something that's on our, our roadmap. We'll be working on it the rest of this summer probably. Um, get that going. Um, but then we also need automated security analysis because from our perspective, you never know what the vulns are and the dependencies you've got. So we'll be doing static analysis on a lot of our stuff and some real-time analysis on things that are key. Um, for us, automation is about failing fast. Yep. So I want to talk through a couple of apps that we have in production today. On the left, where it says help starts here, that is our support portal. If you have questions or issues with your Garmin products and you are in either the US or the UK, you're going to interact with something that looks a lot like this and you will be interacting with Cloud Foundry. And the interesting thing about that app is that's kind of one of our biggest wins to date. The business was highly involved in the development of the application. We started in August of uh, 2016 with a kind of a concept approach and by November we had working uh, code in production. It wasn't live to the end users yet but it was live to our business and they were loving it. Mm -hmm. And the, the true, I would call it the true success story is right before we were going. Don't spill the beans yet. <laughs> Don't spill the beans yet. Right before we were going to go live um, there was a bug and the director of the support group said, hey, we can't go live with this. He sat down with the developer. Literally five minutes later, the developer fixed the code, checked it into the repo, and it was deployed to prod within 15 minutes. So 
he didn't care. I mean, great, we fixed it. Now he, now he trusted us even more. So I think that was the true success story of the... And we live in December or November or something mm -hmm. like that. It's, it's going well. Yeah, we have a great, a great um, product evangelist for Cloud Foundry and that guy now. Yeah, he loves Cloud Foundry. Yeah. Oops, I didn't talk about the other one here. So the other, uh, on the right side, you're looking at uh, our e-commerce platform. And, and today, if you look at any product detail pages, uh, like for instance, the, this watch, um, or if you look at a category of all our wearables or all our automotive or anything like that, you are also dealing with a group of Cloud Foundry web apps and microservices. This uh, app doesn't look like much, but uh, that's our SSO or single sign-on application. And I don't mean single sign-on for our internal domain. This is single sign-on for all of our customers. Uh, I don't remember how many millions of customers we have between Connect and uh, all of, and Fly Garmin and, and some of our other products, but we have, I think, 20, 50 million, somewhere Something in there? Like we have a ton of customers. And this application is how every single one of them signs on to Connect, to buy, to what used to be my Garmin, uh, Garmin Express, uh, Fly Garmin. They all sign in through this application. Not only that, but every single time they make a request, that request uh, on the backside, uh, their, their token is validated against SSO to make sure their, their token is still valid. So this app takes a ton of traffic. Uh, we are also hosting a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, HTML applications, some of our marketing apps including uh, Garmin Turning Points and Probably Wear This. Probably Wear This is, a, is kind of a, it's a cheeky little app that gives you a kind of a quick interview and then tells you, hey, this is the Garmin product you might want to put on your wrist. That's, it's kind of a fun one. SSO was one of our first applications to take production traffic and was also, um, they still do VMs and the only reason they do is because we don't have Cloud Foundry in China yet. <clears throat> uh, one thing we learned with SSO was how incredibly over-provisioned we were on the VM side. So we have, we have SSO running in two data centers. We have, I think at, at the moment, or we had at the, at the time this went live, approximately 12 VMs per data center running SSO. And the two major reasons for that were Christmas Day and the day uh, and the end of the weekend when everyone uploads their, their run data. And I think at some point we had a, a production issue and so they scaled up again to make sure that, that we'd never have that production issue again. But the problem with doing that on VMs is you just stay that way forever. So Christmas comes once a year, we all know that. We're scaled for that, but hey, we're gonna just keep all those VMs around all year long. SSO is running on two Cloud Foundry instances in two data centers in production. I think one might be able to handle the load, but it's a terrible idea to run one instance of, cloud, of, of anything in Cloud Foundry. Uh, for the reasons that were spoken about earlier, the, the previous presentation, uh, you have instances that drop and come back up, all those sorts of things. Uh, in the last two releases, which are, that's how many we have uh, sitting around in, in, uh, in Cloud Foundry, we have the current running instance and we have uh, the previous one in case we need to roll back. Those two instances have autoscaler hooked up to them, but they have never recorded a scaling event. So two instances in two data centers are running our entire production SSO load. Uh, another huge success story uh, for, for Cloud Foundry is uh, ERP. You want to talk to that? Yeah, so we have a group of developers that are fairly new Java developers and really don't understand how to get things to production. And literally, we stood them up with, they probably about 10 ERP services that are actually actually directly accessing our ERP system. And they were able to um, take those 10 services and probably from inception to working in Cloud Foundry maybe a week. And these are what I would call junior Java developers. I mean, they're pretty experienced developers from a perspective of ERP, but from a Java perspective, they're all newbies and they don't know really what they're doing. So we you know, hook them up with a, with a Spring Boot app and give them this pipeline and they deployed. 10 ERP services that are accessing our ERP system in seven days. I mean, that's, that's pretty, pretty impressive for, um, for people who don't really know what they're doing. So I, I think it's a huge success story from that perspective. We would never have been able to do that with VMs. No, not a chance. They would have had to understand how to configure Tomcat or something. Mm -hmm. They would never have figured well, You couldn't out. provision the VMs that fast, yeah. I don't think. So think Sesame Street for a minute. Your presentation today is brought to you by the number 1100. We have a lot of other numbers that we like, but this is the number for today. I like 42. 42 is 42. a good number. 3.14 is a good number. But this is our number today. Why is this our number? 
This is the number of deployments we made to production in one month in December of 2016. That's about 50 times a day. Just let that sink in a minute. That would not have been possible without Cloud Foundry, without deployment pipelines, and without Spring. On their own, those three things are amazing, but when you put them together, do you get this kind of magic? I should say that kind of magic. So where are we now? Uh, we are definitely here. We built it, and they're coming. People are, are interested in our platform, and they're, they're constantly asking us for access to the platform. Uh, I used this slide uh, in 2015 when we were here presenting, and I followed it up with a joke about cat herding, and that is definitely still true. Um, as it turns out, <clears throat> interest has been amazing. We've got it from inside IT and from outside IT. Uh, many groups are now treating Cloud Foundry as their default deployment destination. Uh, I heard the other day, uh, I don't know, how many people in the room are familiar with GDPR? Not very many. So quick explanation, uh, the EU has come up with a number of what they call general data protection, protection requirements, and the fines for not being compliant with those requirements are huge, like 4% of your revenue. Not, you know, not $500 a day or anything like that, but huge revenue percentages. Uh, for all of the apps that need to be built inside Garmin to, to comply with GDPR, they're looking at uh, the standard being you have to have a pipeline, you have to have a Spring Boot app, and you have to deploy it to Cloud Foundry. So that, did you notice the email that Bobby sent this morning? I didn't. So this morning, as of this morning, I got some statistics from uh, essentially what would be our lead architect. He says we now have, as of uh, yesterday, I guess, 400 AIs running in production for Cloud Foundry, which is um, pretty good from our perspective. We had an over a 25% increase in AIs from uh, last month to this month, and we anticipate that growth to just continue to moving forward. So the developers have bought in, and uh, we, we're just getting bigger buy-in all the time. So yeah. it was good, good to stick for him to send me that this morning. Mm -hmm. So uh, on the joke of cat herding, uh, to prevent those kinds of issues, we definitely have a you have to be this tall to ride this ride. Uh, mentality on our team and, and as we're onboarding people into Cloud Foundry. Uh, we are doing 12-factor, that's really important for us. And uh, configuration has been a really interesting thing for us. So when we started down the Cloud Native path, we started to use Config Server and we still do. And the original goal was, hey, all your configs gonna be in Config Server and you're gonna consume all your configuration that way. That has come and it is gone, and we're now looking at config server being kind of a generic place of, hey, where do our services live? And while that seems like it's kind of backward, if you think about a pipeline deployment, sometimes it's faster to just check code in and let the pipeline run and get your app back to production than it is to go change what's in the config server and let that reload the application. So uh, all of our apps are doing zero downtime deployment, so as we make those config changes and we push, we're not taking outages, and, uh, and, and Config Server has, has, it's still valuable to us. We still use it a lot, but, but we've ended up configuring our applications pretty much uh, using properties built into our, our jars. Logging has been a real fun thing for us. Um, with VM development, we, had, uh, we were heavy Splunk users, and all of the logging was, was dropping to file on our VM systems, and then from there we were pushing into Splunk or Elk or other tools like that. Um, obviously with Cloud Foundry, you don't have files, so that's a bit of a challenge. Uh, we also had to turn all of our logging from uh, line-based logging to JSON-based logging, because when you have a log aggregator that's taking multiple instances of your application, uh, and one of them drops a stack trace that interleaves with other logs, and it's almost impossible to tell what's what. So JSON for logging has been, uh, has been a big deal. Um, if we have time at the end, ask us about the stream data platform. We'll tell you a lot more about how we're logging, because we've got some really cool stuff there. Um, but we'll save that for the end to make sure we have enough time. Um, yeah. So from a developer education perspective, though, the problem is, is most of our developers don't really understand what a 12-factor app is. They don't really understand <laughs> how to do the configuration, and they don't really understand logging, so we're still fighting that on a day-to-day -day basis, and we're continually looking for better ways to educate our developers, and part of that is something we will talk about briefly in a minute. So. So where are we going? So from a 
from a build pipeline perspective, we're, we're kind of following the model of, of Spring anyway, is having an opinionated build pipeline. You don't, you get, an, you get a pipeline out of the box and it's gonna make you have it deployed to non-prod and prod, and if you need something else, then that's up to you to figure it out. Um, but that way I can get people up to speed really, really quickly. We have automated routing with um, HA proxy, that, which sits in front of our Cloud Foundry. Um, we need to be much more highly automated from a, from a pipeline perspective. We need to add automated acceptance tests and add, add, add automated rollbacks. Today, we don't have any automated rollbacks. It's all manual. And um, we're in the process of transitioning all our release engineers that used to do all our deploys to us, and they're actually getting to do real work now. So, versus pushing buttons. And then, last but not least, we, we built a lab. We call it Garmin Labs. Um, I would like to think that we got to spend time with our Garmin Labs, but it's not really puppies that we're spending time with. Um, we're spending time building out uh, what I would call our, our, our approach for how we're going to do development. And Jonathan, you could probably talk a little bit about that too. Yeah, so uh, we started out with our, our first lab, was, was, it was BYO as far as the computing in the lab went. You brought your own machine. Uh, pairing that way didn't work out real well. You, you know, I have my own set of keyboard shortcuts. I like Adam. Uh, he, he likes VS Code. We, we debate about that all the time. And, and, and that, that didn't work out so well because, you know, the, just, hey, this is my machine and you, you don't feel totally comfortable using the machine if it's not yours, et cetera. So uh, we have moved on to uh, something much closer to a pivotal lab style where we have uh, single machines with two keyboards, monitors, and mice hooked up. And uh, we have them set so that uh, on Friday afternoon when a team rolls out of the lab, we reimage all those machines. Uh, then we, we, we grant access to the folks that need it and then we script loading everything back up. So when team B walks in Monday morning, they get a machine that looks just like we want it to look. And they can cust customize it if they want or install whatever they need. But I don't have to worry about any baggage that another team has left on a machine. So our goal with labs is to have teams in for uh, six, four to six weeks at a time, we are going to be extremely opinionated about what we do with them while they're there and how they work. And then it's up to them when they go back to uh, their regular, um, their regular uh, work areas to, to take what they want to take. Yeah, we're kind of taking a, uh, we gonna, we're going to introduce a bunch of concepts to them and uh, we're not going to tell them what they have to do, but we're hoping that a lot of it will stick to the wall. So we're going to take a throw it at the wall and hope it sticks approach. Kind of like when you're cooking spaghetti, you might want to throw that at the wall and hope it sticks and then you'll know it's done. But we are going to be extremely opinionated in the lab. So they don't get to do what they want to do in the lab. They have to do it our way in the lab. and. That's going to allow us to try new things and to experiment in the lab with real world problems and real world applications. Okay. So this is kind of, we're a little bit excited about this because this, this is our culture and our development education approach. We are going to be taking our developers down a path that allows them to, to see how to do development in a different way. So mm -hmm. I think that's kind of the, the key to our success moving forward. If the lab doesn't work, then I guess we'll try something else. Yep. We also have, uh, we're transforming our physical space as well. You know, Opal this morning mentioned the idea of the, the cube farm that you kind of smack run into when you walk into most uh, corporations today. Uh, I wouldn't call ours dark or dank, but I would say there are still way too many walls. And we've taken a couple of areas of our, of our IT shop and we have ripped out a lot of walls. We've put people uh, in a fairly lavish like environment and we're kind of experimenting with which one works the best. And so I think in the future you're going to see Garmin having a labs type look throughout our whole floor. And no more gophers popping up. Yeah, that's right. <clears throat> yeah, he's over the wall for me. So I'm always like eh, trying to chat with him. So I think that covers everything that we had planned to say. Uh, we wanted to finish in time for questions. I kind of left some time for that. So if you guys have anything you want to ask us, uh, feel free. And of course you can find us later as well. Yeah, yeah. Yes, we are. Yes. Yes. Uh, mm -hmm. it, the question is whether we're going to end up using public cloud for these applications. And um, right now we're on-prem. Uh, our boss would love us to be able to essentially burst to the cloud whenever we need to, but obviously that's still something we have to figure out. So but we, are, we will be looking at public cloud. Yeah. And really I think the main challenge we've had there, it's, it's easy to push an app to the public cloud. That is not a hard, a hard concept. The, the trouble is getting the data where it needs to be. 
Um, we're using Gemfire, and that, that has made certain parts of, of our infrastructure, such as SSO, very, very uh, HA, and we have that running in two data centers. We have other things that are on RDBMS, and when you start talking about RDBMS, uh, two data centers is hard. I think there was another question in the front. Yes. Oh, oh that was it? Okay. Yes, ma'am. Well, we have it. That's what we want to do. So um, we will be automating scanning of all the applications prior to go live so that um, we won't be pushing products to production that have security vulnerabilities. That's the plan, at least. Right now, the current solution that we're using takes too long to do that as a real-time pipeline. So it's a static analysis that happens offline. And so um, the, the plan is to have something automated soon, probably before the end of the year. Interestingly enough, uh, the tool that we're using, like he mentioned, uh, I, think, I think it's a good tool, but we'd never heard of Sneak before until uh, yesterday. And so we talked to those, uh, the Sneak guys, and that's definitely something we're going to take back to our security team. Just, hey, look, we heard of this. Take a look at it. And so um, you may see Sneak at Garmin at some point in the future. Yep. Can't say yes, because that's not something I call, but it might be there. Any other questions? Well, thank you for your time, everyone. Yeah, thank you, guys.